Good afternoon. This is the worst time of the day for a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> for you and for me, actually. It wasn't, wasn't that a wonderful lunch? <laughs> I get to travel a lot. In fact, yesterday I was in Alabama speaking to uh, beekeepers and, and got in here late last night. But I want you all to know how blessed you are to have an organization like this that you can fellowship, you can have mentors, you can learn about honeybees together, you can do all those things that will help your avocation or your vocation <coughs> and help you enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself a lot. This is, what you do is important. And hopefully we'll, we'll talk a little bit of about that, I'm, a lot of I'm, what I'm going to talk about is going to be supportive of what uh, Juliana and Bill already said, and, and maybe weave in a few things, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Monsanto and uh, why I'm there, and why this might be something that we need to consider consider uh, supporting. And looking at y'all, like I said, I was in Alabama yesterday, and you're a lot better looking than you are. Could, Fred, <laughs> could, you, could you maybe lower the lights up here at this end a little bit? I sure appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Wow. Who here is a new beekeeper, or who here doesn't have bees and is just thinking about it? All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's, right. That's because you don't have that import permit. Yeah. <laughs> who here has been to like, have bees for one to two, three years, something like that? Okay. All right. Good. Well, this is this is a new world for you. It's a fascinating world. Uh, new terminology. As you know, beekeeping is a visual sport. You have to be able to look and compare and contrast. Uh, but it's probably the most amazing thing that you will ever do in your life. And then just think of all the people <coughs> out there, your friends and neighbors and community, that don't have or haven't taken that opportunity to know and do and look. When somebody looks in the beehive, that is amazing. Amazing. <coughs> Several decades ago, we had about five million colonies of honeybees in the United States. A lot of different reasons for it. A lot more people on the farm. They may have <coughs> one or two colonies of bees or, or what have you. And, <coughs> and we don't have that as much now as most of us live in suburbia. Uh, and, and the beekeeping industry has changed, but we've, we've gone down to about two, 2.4 million colonies of honeybees in the whole United States. Most of the honeybee colonies, commercial honeybee colonies, are in almond pollination in California right now. That takes 1.6 million colonies just to pollinate almonds. We got 2.4, so is that too much? Is that not enough? Is this a tipping point? Something for y'all to think about. And not to scare all you new folks, but I will. When I started beekeeping 100 years ago, we didn't have most of these things. Whoa, what did I do? Where's the, where's the red light on it? Fred, come rescue me. There we go. Um, the apiary industry is under siege from pests, predators, and diseases that we didn't have when I started beekeeping. We have, as you heard about, Bill talked so well about American fowl bird disease. We've had that forever. That's always been associated with honeybees. But we have nosema, a gut microsporidian now that attacks the, the guts of honeybees. We have Nosema serrana that's from an Asian species of honeybee that has come into the United States. We have about uh, 27, 28 viruses that have been discovered ever since CCD, colony collapse disorder. I've been on the CCD working group since its inception and we've had a lot of smart people with expensive equipment look at honeybees more closely than ever. So we found all these viruses, what they mean, we're not quite sure anymore. We have uh, other insect pests, we have wax moths and small hive beetles that you heard about, and, and varroa mites. 
And so when you add all these things together, honeybees simply aren't as healthy as they were years ago. We have this unadapted European species of bee with all these other inputs, these parasites, these microsporidium, these funguses, these viruses from other places in the world. Being on the CCD working group, this is our, our tabulations of our surveys over the last several years. We're going to be taking surveys for 2012-13 here in about another month. But as you can see, we have about a 30% loss of honeybees consistently over time. If you're a small business person, commercial beekeeper, if you're a small business person and you're losing 30% of your inventory every year, that simply is not a good business model. You cannot sustain that forever. And this is just a window in time. Some commercial beekeepers have told me that over the course of a whole year, they lose 75 to 80 percent of their colonies. They are continuously splitting, dividing, splitting, dividing. If honeybee biology didn't allow us to change or turn one colony into two or three or four, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. There wouldn't be any bees. But how long can we continue to do this? Are we at some kind of a tipping point? Because there are more pollinator dependent agricultural crops planted now than any other time in the history of the world. Apples, berries, strawberries, blueberries, almonds in California right now that are totally dependent on a honeybee taking pollen from one part of the flower to another part so a seed can develop, so the seed can be fertilized. If the seed isn't fertilized by that male pollen grain, that fruit or vegetable or berries under no obligation to build a fruit or berry or what have you around that. Flat-sided apple, apples generally have about seven seeds. <coughs> if only six seeds are produced, you get a funny shaped apple that, for the most part, you won't see in the store <coughs> because they don't meet standards. Watermelons, crooked uh, cucumbers, all these things that are pollinator dependent, dependent on your Honeybees, whether you are small or large. But we can make kind of a laundry list of colony losses and why. Certainly globalization and homogenization of pest predators and diseases. With our global economy, things move around the world quickly. You can be in Asia in probably uh, you know, 15 hours or so from here. And things can come back. Everything that comes in on Walmart on a pallet has something on it. And sometimes that's something on it, likes the United States or Texas or what have you. You have a huge port system. Production agriculture, we just eat very well because of production agriculture. Is it a perfect system? No, it's not a perfect system, but that's the model and that's how we feed each other right now. But having 500 acres of something simply is not normal or natural in the general environment and it requires a lot of inputs in order to make that successful. There are seven billion of us on the earth today and we eat very well in this country because of production agriculture but for a honeybee, mild crops, one type of pollen that doesn't have the all the essential amino acids in the right proportion, uh, nectar and the crop inputs are tough on honeybee. <coughs> Production beekeeping, you got two colonies in your backyard, that's different than most commercial beekeepers that might have 500, 1,000, <coughs> 10,000. Largest beekeeper in the United States has 100,000 colonies. And that is not <coughs> unlike production agriculture takes a lot of inputs to keep that going. That is different than your beekeeping in many cases. But that is how they service those production dependent agricultural acres. Pesticide misuse, just talked to you about that this morning. You're a homeowner, you read the label. Who here reads labels? 
<laughs> yeah, a bunch of liars. Yeah. <laughs> but a teaspoon is good, two, two, two spoons, teaspoons better, isn't it? And it's the same way with beekeeping. We have a lot of inputs we have to put into our colonies, and sometimes we misuse those too. Eliminating productive locations for honeybees. Corn, what's corn at? Eight, nine dollars a bushel. Beans at 12, 13, 14. Yes, they're going to plant everything they possibly can. These are farmers trying to make a living, trying to take care of their families. But does it help us? No, it doesn't really help us too well. But actually, beekeepers that are in suburbia and cities are actually pretty successful because there are a lot of things moving and growing in these areas that are protected. Entomophobia. You may have already discovered some of this. Fear of insects. <coughs> a lot of your neighbors, if they even know that you're a beekeeper, are probably a little suspicious of you. One, you like an insect. Nobody likes insects. <laughs> We've all been trained that insects are bad, and we have all sorts of stuff under our kitchen cabinets to kill insects. Who here wants cockroaches in your kitchen? No, nobody does. But yet, you are embracing an insect, and an insect that can hurt you. And then, if your neighbors see you, you dress up in what looks to them like a hazmat suit. <laughs> and you have a can that somehow is on fire. And that's just not right, folks. And so a lot of people will call their city council person right away and finger you as something that's dangerous, that's not needed, uh, that can hurt your children, their pets, and what have you. So a lot of this is on your shoulders to educate your neighbors. Low honey prices? Honey prices right now, probably wholesale, are higher than they have been in, in quite, a, quite a while. But I don't think you're getting the value you should for your honey. What other natural process? Honeybees going out and collecting nectar from flowers, uh, turning it into honey. Uh, your efforts to keep them alive to do this, harvesting the honey and capping it, putting it in a jar, what have you. I don't think that the prices that most beekeepers are getting are what you deserve. Wholesale prices, honey in a barrel is honey in a barrel is honey in a barrel regardless of where it comes from, <clears throat> whether it comes from Africa, Asia, or the United States. It's a generic product, but what you produce hopefully is regional, local, and has a lot of value. And you should be probably getting five, six, seven, eight dollars a pound for your honey. Low pollination prices. Beekeepers, I'm in pollination right now. There's a shortage of honeybees because we're going to have a significant loss this year. Are up over $200 per colony. But yet, almonds are about $3 a pound and they produce 8,000 pounds per acre. So that two colonies per acre, that's $400 for an almond production. That's, that's lunch, that isn't even lunch money, is it? That's snack money. Because if they didn't have honeybees to pollinate, taking the male pollen from one quarter of the flower to another, they would get this, zero. So beekeepers, are always apologetic for some reason, but you all are in the driver's seat. This, in my mind, is our number one problem. We're all mine. Everybody has to do this. Make a fist. Everybody. You can't leave to make a fist. Put it someplace on your body. Proportionally, this is about how large a varroa mite is to a honeybee's body. Piercing its cuticle. Sucking its hemolymph, its blood, vectoring viruses, <coughs> leaving open wounds that bacteria can get in, causing immunosuppression of <coughs> bees so that those latent benign viruses that are in there can start replicating and growing. <coughs> this, if we could control varroa mites, 
safely and sanely, we would be in good shape. We would probably <coughs> eliminate 70 to 80 percent of honeybee health problems if we could do this. Right now, we have to control and have had to for 30 years. We've been talking about varroa mites for 30 years when they were introduced from the Apis serrana in Asia. Killing a little bug on a big bug is tough. And we have learned to introduce pesticides into our honeybee colonies. Can you imagine that? There again, when I was there, when this happened, and I thought that beekeepers would resist this 100%, because beekeepers had traditionally always been concerned about pesticide kills and what have you, and, and, the, and the bad farmers and the bad growers and what they did and what they did wrong. And beekeepers were the fastest i would ever seen in my whole life embrace putting pesticides in a column. It was amazing to me. So, but we did it, and we had to do that to survive, to keep the industry alive. But these chemicals that are put in a colony, beeswax is a chemical sponge, as Juliana said. It absorbs everything, hangs on to it. So the bees are exposed to these things 24-7, 365. Plus, bees, when they get these compounds on them, most of the time it can't get through their cuticle because it's kind of waxy and it's kind of hard. But what do bees do to each other and themselves all the time? They groom themselves. And they ingest this stuff. Just like a cat licking itself all the time. They ingest this stuff and it causes health problems. Longevity problems, queen problems, drone problems. So we have to find a better way to control varroa absolutely positively. These are <coughs> some of the residues that we found in wax from the colony collapse working group. We took samples of colonies and the wax and the bees and what have you. And I don't know if you can see it. First two items are Kumavos, check mine. Number two is fluvalinate, apistan, in 100% of colonies. And then all these other things I can't pronounce. Bees are environmental samplers. They go out two to three miles of forage and are exposed to a lot of things, and it's not unusual to find other things. But what happens when you mix all these things in a beehive? What happens when you mix them in a beeswax matrix? Nobody really knows. Nobody knows what that synergism is. When you mix kumaphos and fluvalinate together, is it better? Is it worse? Are the breakdown products, the metabolites, worse than the active? We don't know. And then we got the CCD factor, colony collapse disorder. About 2006, I was the chief of the apiary section for the Florida Department of Agriculture and CCD was first identified in Florida with one of our large commercial beekeepers. At first, I didn't believe it. You know, I had people call me all the time, the bees are dying, what have you, and this one gentleman, David Hackenberg, kept calling me, and I finally listened to him. And I went to see his bees, and it was different. Bees weren't dead on the ground. They were just gone. Like they'd been beamed up. There was brood in there, so the bees had been there recently to feed that brood. The queen was still there, because the queen is always there. She has a small retinue of bees, but she's like she's hiding in the back. But the bees are just simply gone. Normal ratio of bees, it takes about two bees to take care of one cell of brood. When that reverses, when that changes, that shows a population 
drop, and so we're calling that CCD. The queen's always there. Bromide levels are low, so it's not that suspect. And nosema, which is in all bees, isn't that much either. It wasn't a big deal. So something else is going on, and we still haven't figured it out after these several years either. <clears throat> but the areas of focus for honeybee health are stress. Can you imagine picking up an insect's nest from Texas, honeybee nest, loading it on a semi, driving it to California, different time zones, different weathers, moving it in February. California doesn't have anything more blooming there than we do here. So you have a nutrition issue. And having that insect adapt, what other insect nests can you pick up and do that? You can't do that. But we've been doing that for years, but it is a stress. Varroa mites, absolutely, positively, a major, major problem for honeybees and their keepers. And then you have all these management uh, nutrition issues and pesticides that we apply, pesticides that bees are exposed to the environment. And then all these secondary <coughs> pathogens and pests and predators move in as this colony weakens, the wax moths and the small hive beetles and the nosemas and what have you. So this is honeybee health. This will be on the test. So study hard. But let's just weave through this here just briefly. Up in the upper left-hand corner, agricultural practices. If your bees are next to 500 acres of corn, corn's wind pollinated. But if there isn't anything else for the bees to forage on, what are they going to forage on? That. Just the way it is. And then chemical use. We eat very well because of chemical use. But some applicators are better than others. Some products are less of a problem to honeybees than others. And then you have, you know, drift and are they doing it right and what have you, all these other kind of questions. And then you have beneficial microbes. Uh, that are associated with honeybees. Real quickly, because this would be another talk some other time, but honeybees don't eat pollen. They can't eat pollen. Can't digest it. Can't break open the exine. Yeast. That's a hard coat on pollen. They eat bee bread, which is fermented pollen that allows the pollen grain to break open and let all the goodies out. <coughs> so what happens if uh, bees are exposed to some of these pesticides and fungicides that upset that beneficial microbes that turn pollen into bee bread? Kind of like yogurt or kefir or something. It has to have those. And then you have pathogen competition. If you unbalance that, what pathogen or organism is going to take advantage of that situation? and predominate, which may or may not be good for the honeybee. And then you got residues in the hive, beeswax we talked about, chemical sponge, miticides, antibiotics. Miticides, you had a terrific talk from Juliana about what can happen with miticides. Pesticides, pesticides in an insect's colony. And then antibiotics, <coughs> Real quickly, because this is another talk. Anti against biotic life. Bees eat bee bread, fermented thing that is further broken down by bacteria in a honeybee's gut. And I know this is really soon after lunch, but and I'll just use my self example so you don't have to. But we all are sitting here probably because we benefited from antibiotics in our life at one point or another. Do a good thing when they're targeted and focused. But Jerry Hayes, a time or two, has gotten diarrhea from antibiotics because my digestion doesn't take place in my stomach either. It takes place in my intestines where there are gazillions of bacteria and yeast and fungus and what have you that digest my food, even make some B vitamins and some other things. 
So when you wipe out the good stuff, you can't digest any food. And so if you're feeding antibiotics to your bees prophylactically, that means just because, you're affecting your honeybees' health. You're wiping out the good bacteria that helps them digest things. As in another example, prophylactically treating honeybees. Just feed them antibiotics because you're afraid that they're going to get something some other time. Who here is taking antibiotics right now because you're afraid you're getting a strep throat next week? Yeah, think about it. Pathogens, parasites, bacteria, viruses. Some of the holding yards in California have tens of thousands of colonies that they're just waiting to go into the almond groves. They are sharing everything. Bees drift. Some beekeeper had treated for varroa. Some didn't treat as well. This one has a back. And they all, sh it's kind of like an elementary school. Everybody's sharing everything. And so how do you control that? And then you have beekeepers applying things inappropriately, not reading label directions. And so you have this whole resistance issue of what we're creating a bigger problem for ourselves. And then beekeeper practices. Bees are amazing because they are so, so <coughs> forgiving. We can do all sorts of things with a honeybee colony up to a point and not kill them. So what you do and where you keep them in top bar hives and all this other kind of stuff is fine. Bees are very forgiving. Are you using your bees for honey production, which is different than renting them for pollination services and what they're exposed to? Grow management, disease management, all these things. So this is honeybee health. And to get this all balanced and get this all firing on the right cylinders is tough to do. It's simply hard to do. <clears throat> Let's talk about ecosystems for a minute. Everybody here knows what an ecosystem is. You all been out to the lake or the river, been hunting. It's that balance in nature, that normal natural balance in nature, where you have trees and bushes and bugs and deer and squirrels and turkey and everything is in balance, not one thing is taking over another. They're all kind of working off each other. That balance can be changed. You can have a flood, you can have a fire, but healthy ecosystems will rebalance themselves so that you don't have one species invasive taking over another one's space. Let's look at a honeybee colony as an ecosystem. Same kind of thing. Instead of trees and bushes and turkeys and squirrels and stuff, we have all these different kinds of bees. We have queens, we have drones, we have workers. We have different workers of different ages who do different things. And they're all, if everything is right, all contributing to the health of the colony. Ruth being taken care of, foragers are bringing in food, the queen is laying properly, guard bees are doing their thing. All this stuff is in balance, but that balance can be tipped as well. Varroa, Osema, mitocides, what have you. And the problem is that I very, very rarely see anymore big boomer honeybee colonies like I saw years and years and years ago because of all these things that bees haven't adapted to and then how we are managing those parasites and diseases. Because honey production is wonderful, but this is the real reason honeybees are important. <coughs> Taking pollen, those are pollen grains, male element of a flower, from flower to flower to fertilize that seed we talked about. Think of a watermelon, seeded watermelon. Let's say it's got 500 seeds in it. Each one of those seeds has to have a pollen grain, a male associated with it, to fertilize that seed. <clears throat> or the watermelon won't build 
a watermelon around that seed. Or blueberries, or strawberries, or apples, or peaches, or pears, or cranberries. Or the other 30% of the food that you and I depend on every day that honeybees are responsible for producing. I had breakfast with Bill this morning, Bill Baxter, and Bill had a pretty nice breakfast. He had some of that granola stuff, had nuts in it and fruit and what have you. And he had a nice big glass of juice and a cup of coffee with cream and some eggs. Nice little pile of, <coughs> of fruit there and, and toast with some jam. And so I was just thinking, what did Bill's breakfast, or what would Bill's breakfast look like if honeybees weren't involved in helping produce that? That's what Bill's breakfast would look like without your honeybees. The granola stuff is still there, but the nuts and the fruits and what have you that are part of that are gone. They didn't have a pollinator. They don't exist anymore. Juice is gone because honeybees didn't pollinate the fruit to make the juice. Coffee's a little gone because bees do pollinate coffee to some degree, but the cream's all gone because the bees have to pollinate the forage to feed the cow to make the milk to make the cream. His nice pile of fruits are gone. <coughs> Go pollinate it. And the jam on his toast is gone. Could we eat and live off a diet like this? Yeah, we probably could. Our ancestors did. We ate mostly wind-pollinated wheat and rice and rye and corn and what have you. But for nutrition, for variety, for acceptance, we like all those things that are now gone from Bill's breakfast that your honeybees are responsible for. <coughs> I'll let you look at this while I tell you my Monsanto story. I, about a year ago, made the transition from the chief of the apiary section for the state of Florida to Monsanto. Who here hates Monsanto, just so as I know? Okay, excellent. All right, good. Good. It's always good to know who your friends are. Monsanto had purchased a company by the name of Biologics in Israel. Biologics had been using a new non-chemical, non-GMO, normal natural process called RNA to control a virus in honeybees, Israeli acute paralysis virus, that early on was correlated with colony collapse disorder. <coughs> Biologics had learned how to manufacture this RNA a lot cheaper than can be bought on the market. Monsanto, they want to get away from chemicals because chemicals, after a while, simply don't work. Insects become resistant to them, uh, weeds become resistant, all these things. So they're looking for new biologicals all the time. So they bought this company and pat them on the back they kept the honeybee piece. Why would this big, successful seed company keep a honeybee thing? Because they realize how important honeybees are to their agricultural, sustainable agricultural platform. <clears throat> They've discovered, after they bought this company, Monsanto has 22,000 employees, that they didn't have anybody there who knew anything about honeybees. So you're looking at one twenty-two thousandths of Monsanto. <laughs> I have looked at beekeepers and Morella for the last 30 years and have seen the industry crawl on its hands and knees to USDA and with all respect, Juliana, universities, research people begging with their hands out for something to help the industry to control pest predators and diseases. And so what we got when 
Barilla first came on the market was fluvalinate, synthetic pyrethroid, was off patent. The company took it off the shelf, reformulated it down so that you could kill a little bug, but you wouldn't kill the big bug right away. Big bug is going to be hurt, chronic damage all the time. And then Varela became resistant to fluvalinate and they came out with Kumafos. Off patent, off the shelf, old chemical, an organophosphate. For any of you that know anything about chemicals out there, bad stuff. Formulated it down to kill the little bug on the big bug. But the big bug is always hurt. And you saw those residue levels. Nothing else is coming on. Everything else that you have is a chemical in one way or another. You have Hopgard, you have Applegard, you have Apple Life Bar, uh, now you have the Amitraz product, you have all these things. Those are all, in one way or another, pesticides. We have to get away from doing this. Or, we're going to have to build breed bees that are resistant to all chemicals. <clears throat> So I thought I'd stick my neck way outside my shell and join Monsanto to see if I could keep them on track because they have deep pockets, they have more smart scientists and expensive equipment than I've ever seen in my whole life, and they have a commitment <coughs> to honeybee health. When I first started with them, they were going to come out with a product for Israeli Q paralysis virus, this one that Neologix was working on. I told them, no, why? Israeli Q paralysis virus has, doesn't do anything to honeybee colonies generally. It doesn't bring any value to beekeepers. <coughs> we're not going to bring something to the market that has no value for you, that's all fluff and superficial. No way. So the blood drained out of their carpet faces, and they went along with me. So what we're looking at now is targeting seven or eight different honeybee viruses, along with the Israeli acute paralysis virus, deformed wing virus, saccharide virus, acute bee paralysis virus, all these viruses. And my personal favorite, Varroa. If we could control Varroa without chemicals, without GMO, without <coughs> modifying a honeybee using a normal natural process, I'm all for it. Everybody here knows what DNA is? Mm -hmm. It's in every cell of your body, in the nucleus. It's the code that makes you, you. Everything about you, everything. Your skin, your nose, your digestive juices, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your, your bones, your muscle cells, your intestinal juices, your lip, everything about you is in DNA. And DNA tells, has that code that tells your cells what to make and what to do. To turn a protein on or turn it off. It's happening in you right now, at this very moment. We just ate a ton of RNA because it's in everything. It's in plants, it's in animals, it's in everything because it's what is used to turn protein on or off. So DNA, the cell needs to do something, make hair. So DNA throws out the instruction for hair, and RNA takes it to the spot of the cell and says, make hair. And then the DNA says, well, let's not make hair anymore. Let's do something else. So it'll send the thing out, and RNAi, RNA interference, will turn off that ability for your cell to make hair. And this happens in your body all the time, every day. 24-7-365. Well, we can, if you look at how a virus works for this Israeli acute paralysis virus, you know a virus enters your cell and takes over your cell machinery, it takes over your DNA, has its own cell, and so your cells make viruses that make you sick. Well, we can use 
the cell's own template for making RNA to turn that virus off because you eventually get well, don't you? Your cold is over in three or four days. That's because your cells and your body is, has made enough RNAi to turn off the viruses. Well, we can duplicate that RNAi, feed it to bees, have that go into the bee cell and turn off it's really acute paralysis virus and the form wing virus, the acute bee paralysis virus, and what have you. It's like giving your bees a vaccination. It's what they would have done anyway. It's non-chemical, it's normal, it's natural. It's not changing their genetics because this stuff is the normal protein that's in them. What isn't used is broken down. If you spill the stuff on the ground, it's the protein and something in the ground will eat it, a bacteria or fungus or what have you, eats it. It's been given the highest recommendation by the European Union uh, because it is a normal natural process. And I think this is an opportunity for us to control some honeybee presbyterian diseases using this technique. So what we're looking at now is controlling Varroa. We found that we can feed this stuff to honeybees in sugar syrup, have it get into honeybees. When the Varroa feeds on them, it takes this up. So if we can locate those targets in Varroa that we can turn off protein synthesis, we can do this non-chemically, non-GMO, and remove 100% pesticides that you're having to put in a honeybee column. And this is just a diagram that uh, RNAi can turn on or turn off protein synthesis as we talked about. But that's going to take a while. That's probably going to take a few years. So what do we do in the meantime? Trying to keep Monsanto engaged, we have collaborated with Project Apis Mellifera, big uh, uh, NGO, non-governmental organization out in California that helps almond growers and, and uh, beekeepers. Um, and so they're working on a project for honeybee forage. Honeybees, uh, we take them uh, in you know, February to California. As wonderful as you think California is, February is still February in California. There's nothing blooming, there's nothing growing, they have no nutrition, there's no plants, there's no flowers. So what do you do for honeybee nutrition? Certainly beekeepers can feed uh, protein supplements to them, pollen patties, but none of those are nutritionally complete. Bees can't get all their 10 essential amino acids from them. Bees, and this is another story, this is another presentation. Bees don't eat soybean flour, or yeast, or any of this stuff put in a patty flocked in the middle of their colony. 99% of the time, what you think they're doing eating it is dragging it out as trash. <clears throat> because that's not where honeybees find food. It would be like me coming into your house and with a shovel full of jello and, and salmon throw it in your living room floor. What are you going to do with it? Well, clean it out. So anyway, that's another reason. So what we're doing is having Monsanto support Pam so that they can purchase seed for flowers that will bloom at this early spring period of time to feed honeybees, give them the nectar and the pollen resources that they need for health during that time. And if you can keep them a little bit healthy, then hopefully it will extend through the rest of the year because nutrition is such a big part of honeybee health. So, Monsanto realizes that honeybees are important. Monsanto spends about $8 million a year renting honeybee colonies from beekeepers to pollinate canola, uh, their veg uh, seed crops, uh, uh, and some cotton as well. And they realize that these losses of 30% a year are unsustainable, and Monsanto, like them or not, has the expertise to make these things happen that we're still talking about 30 years later. 
Seven billion of us on the earth at this time. Seven billion. Every day we wake up, this is something new. We've never done this before. Going to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 billion. In just a few years, 2030, there's going to be another 1.4 billion people on earth. That's like adding a whole other China. And, as you know, people in India and Asia, their incomes are rising. And what happens when people's income rise? They want better food, don't they? They want those fruits and vegetables and meat. In the U.S., we eat about 100, and this is round figures, 150 pounds of meat per year. Asians are up to 70. They want to get to 150 because they want to be like us. They want to have those good food, that nutrition. So that means a global demand for grain is going to go through the roof as well. And we only have so much arable land, and we have to get as much yield out of that land as possible. But does any of this matter? Everybody knows food comes from the grocery store. They grow it in the back, right? Most people have no connection to agriculture, <laughs> nor do they care. They'll complain about everything. But are they really looking? Are they really thinking about how important our own sustainable agriculture is? As imperfect as it is, it's still ours. Because 40% of our veggies are going to be coming from someplace else by 2012. <coughs> what year is that? We're already there, aren't we? And the U.S. will be a net food importer in 50 years. Now, every time I go to the gas station, I got somebody smiling at me from someplace else for buying their gas. They're telling me how much I got to pay for it, when I can have it, and we're going to turn our food production over to somebody else? They can tell us, yeah, you can have apples, but they're going to be $7.50 each, and you can only have them uh, in uh, September. Or, yeah, I know that shipment of, uh, of lettuce uh, didn't come in from uh, Costa Rica, so you can't have a salad. I think that's a dumb move, folks. And you're part of agriculture, whether you want to be or not. Certainly, Fred is attached probably more closely than others, but you are part of it too because your honeybees fly in that two to three mile radius, pollinating not only stuff in your yard, your neighbor's yard, those fruit trees that produce food for people. But then think of all the things your honeybees do that produce a seed or a berry or a nut that feed birds and turkeys and deer or what have you, or allow that plant to reproduce to make that seed. So what you do is vitally, vitally <coughs> important. And I don't know that you all know that enough. What you do is key to the health of our environment in general and us. Thank you very much. I probably have some time for, for some questions, so hit me with your best shot. How far off is the uh, development of uh, the uh, system toward uh, attack, uh, working with, against the Varroa mine? What we're looking at now are, are finding these um, protein targets that we want to turn on or off right now. Um, and so hopefully we will have those selected this year. Our biggest problem is we can, as I said, we can feed this to honeybees and sugar syrup. They can take it up, grow and feed on them. Now we have to figure out what the proper dosage is and what have you. And because this stuff is a protein, we have to get it into the bees pretty quick because you probably know you put a feeder on and it gets moldy and, and what have you in there and because it's eating the stuff in the sugar shed. 
this stuff is a protein and it'll get eaten up too. So we have all these things to work through, so several years would be, be my guess. But, but, but within a few years. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Bill? I think one of the things we're starting to realize nutritionally is how important diversity of pollen is to honeybees, and not just the same thing every day, every day. Yeah, those mono crops, that be, would just be one pollen. Bees, as you know, as if you watch bees going in and out of your hive or look at the bee bread that's produced, is different colors. Those colors indicate different plants and indicate um, that diversity that Bill's talking about of, of food. We eat a diversity of food every day because we have to have those balance of proteins and vitamins and minerals and what have you. Because if I fed you Wonder Bread three meals a day, you're going to be okay for a while, but pretty soon you're going to get sick because it doesn't contain everything that you need. So this balance, just diversity, and that's why honeybees foraging in such a wide area helps them uh, survive. But if you intentionally put your colonies in production agriculture, it makes it much tougher for them to do that. We understand that RNAi. You know, turning on and off of the proteins is, is a normal and natural process, but our controlling of it isn't. What do you mean? What, what are the long-term or effects that may be expected for turning like, on and off proteins? Like, like what do you mean? Um, maybe affecting the long-term uh, ability of the hive to reproduce. I mean, oh, okay. effects we just don't know yet. Yeah, no, and that's a great question. So the question was, what are the long-term health and safety right. implications of feeding them. This stuff is focused and targeted. It only works on those protein switches on or off that you designed it for. It doesn't work for any others. And so in honeybees, the honeybee genome has been sequenced and the varroa genome has been sequenced so we can pick out ones that won't overlap. And then on the varroa, we can target I don't know, maybe we can target the queen's ability to make um, the covering for eggs. And there's a hole in it. And so that when she, she could still be there but lay eggs and nothing ever happens, so like this. But it doesn't have any other effect on anything else. And this is a cool thing about it because it's targeted and focused and won't have any overlap. And so that safety issue hopefully will, will be taken care of because you have to select the things or it won't work for you. It just won't work. Uh, are you saying the uh, pollen substitutes, the yeast and stuff in there, are, are really helping the bees? The, the bees eat yeast? I don't know. No, I mean, do that. I mean, when they go out in the wilderness. I don't know, really know what they eat. I yeah. mean, they sell it, it's marketed. So that's why. Well, I've got some swampland in North Dakota that you can have too that I'll sell to you. Well, they don't, you're not promoting that good enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's all marketing. It's, bees, not, it's not pollen, it's a substitute. I it's a you know what it is. But right. I mean, are you saying it's not really good for the bees? Probably 90% of the time it does virtually no good at all because bees, it's not their normal natural food. They have a really hard time digesting it because it's it's unnatural. It mean it would be like I'm gonna probably pick a poor analogy. Um I could I could feed you I could feed you sawdust. Now there's nutrition in sawdust if you're a creature that can eat sawdust. But if I feed you sawdust, nothing's going to happen because your body is not designed to digest sawdust. So if you got some substance that really actually has pollen in it, that would that would be useful. that would be health. And, and also, and, and we did a paper, and I was never able to, to finish this whole course of things, but. I've been thinking about this for years, and so several years ago, um, we took pollen stuff, the dry stuff, the soybean flour, what have you, that is commercially available, and this is a rocket science. And I was thinking, well, gee whiz, you know, bee bread is fermented, it has a certain pH, uh, it has a certain consistency, um, and, and it has all these microbes in it, probiotics, for lack of a better word. So what I did is I sent some of my staff to the health food store and we got soy yogurt. Yogurt had been produced on soy 
we mixed it into the soy thing and we fermented the soy flour, the protein with the soy yogurt, and made patties and fed it to bees. And the interesting thing is we, we took that, we took some stuff with pollen in it, and then we took just the regular stuff that didn't have, I mean, it was just prepared per label directions, you just mixed it up. And we had um, traps in the bottom that collect uh, debris. And so we had a debris score. And so you know where I'm going with this. It, <coughs> yeah. yeah, it was disappearing. And if you weren't paying attention, the, yeah, it was, the, were the bees eating it or were they dragging it off as trash? And most of the time they're dragging it off as trash. Bees will, however, take grain dust. I have chickens also. And there's always bees hanging around my chicken sure. feeders. And they do eat grain dust. No, they collect grain dust. And they ferment it? I'm asking. I mean, no, most of the time they bring it back and it winds up in the cells and nothing happens to it because the organisms that they have can't ferment that. When you're starving, when you're starving, okay, this is neat. I'm an old guy, so I have all sorts of stuff in my brain. <laughs> they found this guy in Sweden that uh, had been killed and had fallen in a bog and was mummified. Poof. So they took him apart and they looked in his stomach and I guess when he was in a cage or tied up or what. Varroa on the Asian species, Apis thorana of honeybees, only attacks the drone brood. Uh, they, you know, a good parasite doesn't kill its host, and so they do that. But on our European Apis mellifera, they have figured out a way to do it. They like our drone brood better because it has a longer developmental period, and so they can complete their developmental period and be a little bit more successful. But they attack workers as well. So. Uh, yes, I would agree with you 100% that this is part of it. The problem is that keeping that trait, and Juliana can probably speak to this, keeping that trait in the general population is almost impossible. Because unless somebody is artificially inseminating or has some closed breeding population on an island in the middle of the Gulf, you can't maintain those genetics. There was a researcher when I was in Florida that had developed a bee that could recognize Varroa in cells. Just about 100% of the time, opened those cells up and dragged the brood out. And you know how big the colonies got? Because they were dragging out brooding all the time. So, so yes, absolutely, but have we figured out how to do that? Well, we haven't. And I hate to say this, but you know, the chemicals that we've used for grow control save the industry's butt, but it didn't allow the bees to develop a whole lot of resistance because we stepped in and have put in this stopgap measure using chemicals to control grow up instead of an enhanced breeding program or letting Darwin. So, okay, part two. Um, and the, if you have a, you develop a substance that you feed to the bees, what is to stop the varroa from mutating and spoiling your whole project? Another excellent question. The question was, if we develop this RNA to turn a protein mm -hmm. on or off, what's to prevent varroa, in this case, from developing resistance like it develops resistance to everything else? And the way we're going to do that is select five or six different protein switches, and if we can do five or six, the organism going to be really, really tough for them to figure out four or five or six things all in one thing. One thing, oh, absolutely true. Two things, probably. You get past two, and it really, really makes it hard for Varroa to do that. So, excellent question. Yes, ma'am. With the millions, the possible billions of money that went into the Millions, yeah. Yeah, the, the question is, what does Monsanto get out of working with honeybees? Yeah. Um, and so, excellent question again. Globally, there's some money to be made on controlling Varroa and honeybees. 
globally. So they're looking at that. Is there a lot of money to be made? Not as much as corn or the soybeans or whatever else they make. That's true. But they're using this technology to help them learn how they can control corn rootworms, corn earworms, all these other stuff now that they have to use chemical or chemicals have to be used on to controlling them because you can use RNA pretty effectively on insects. We're still learning this. There was a Nobel Prize for this stuff in 2006, so we're not that far down the road. So we're we're learning a lot about this. But there's a lot of other organisms that are out there that could be targeted that are developing resistance to chemicals. And this way is normal, natural. Um, control an insect and not have as much environmental uh, problems. Um, Monsanto doesn't like it in feed up. Um, but they're, it's successful because farmers, growers, love their products. And I've talked to some growers and farmers who are also beekeepers, and they get teed off at beekeepers because they say, why are beekeepers wanting to control or marginalize or minimize my use of something that's approved by EPA and FDA and everything else that I use to take care of my family and uh, send my kids to school and everything else. So I think as beekeepers we have a legitimate right and we need to do some things better, but I don't know that we can pit one part of agriculture against another. I think that's counterproductive and, and we'll just lose both ways on that. And that's just my opinion. There was a rumor a couple of years ago that was floating throughout the industry that, that this was coming, and hopefully you could shed some light on it or put a stop to it, about the fact, the question the lady just asked about the monetary comeback was that if Monsanto contributed all this money into this breeding situation, then we would be facing the same situation as we do with the cotton. and. Uh, some of our other things, which we're now got Roundup Ready alfalfa and some of these other things that are hitting the market now, uh, as tech fees being charged to the beekeepers, is there any truth to any of that? No, I told them that in, if they move forward with any breeding scheme, I mean, I've heard this before, Monsanto wants to breed honeybees that will only pollinate Monsanto crops, um, <laughs> and, and stuff, like, stuff like that. And I told them, one, you couldn't do it, and even if you tried, for what what it means, I, I can't stay there and do that. Because um, I told them, I, I, you know, the holy grail for me is varroa, and if we can control varroa non-chemically, non-GM, somebody will get a statue in the parking lot, and it'll make you guys a little bit of money, and make you guys a lot better, a lot, more a little lot better than you do now. I think Monsanto has a compelling story to tell many times, there again, they're successful because a certain group of folks like their product, but they've done a horrible job telling the story. It's just, it's just horrendous. And, and, and so, so because of that, they put on blinders, and we'll focus on the corn growers and the bean growers and the heck with everybody else. And I think they're finally realizing that the heck with everybody else isn't going to work or the way to go. And so they're starting to, to put their neck out, and I certainly have mine out, too. Anything else? Well, I am honored to be here with you. I'm honored to be invited to come, and I'll be sitting in the, in the back of the room the rest of the afternoon, and, and thank you all for being big people.